I'm Diana Furchgott Roth. I run uh, a division of a small think tank uh, in the United States called the Manhattan Institute. It has uh, about 70 different scholars on a variety of subjects. You can find us on the internet at manhattan-institute.org. There are a number of these research organizations in the United States called think tanks, both looking at free market economics and also looking at more government-oriented solutions. So there's the Brookings Institute, uh, the Center for Economic Progress. Uh, it's uh, a very popular uh, way of communicating economics information. So we don't just have the universities where academics teach students. We also have these research institutes where we write articles and papers and we have conferences where, where we invite in the public to talk about subjects of economic interest. Well, I like to say that I'm working my way through the think tanks in alphabetical order. I was also at the American Enterprise Institute where uh, Mark was, uh, is right now. Uh, then I was at the Hudson Institute and now I'm at the Manhattan Institute. I joke that I'm gonna move on to the Mercatus uh, the Mercatus Center, and then maybe on to the Urban Institute, which is more left-wing. I've also had a number of jobs in government. So it's popular in the United States for when uh, you have a job in government, then the job ends, many people go and work at these think tanks. So I started out in the 1980s working at the White House uh, for President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors as a junior staff economist. Uh, the Council of Economic Advisors uh, at the White House is a group of economists, about 23 of us or so, that advise the president on economic issues. And the president, uh, you might think of the White House as one group working all on the same track, but no, it is uh, there's a lot of uh, dissent within the White House and many people don't want to hear the views of the economists because they'll say, uh, as uh, Russ mentioned before, well, you know, the economists say you should let prices work or just don't do anything about it. And uh, when I worked at the Council of Economic Advisors later in 2001 to 2002 as chief of staff of the group under President George W. Bush, I used to say my job was getting my staff into meetings to which they were not invited. I always had to try to make, uh, to make us uh, uh, be included in the meetings because there were people who would be wanting to put, for example, steel tariffs on. And the Council of Economic Advisors would be against steel tariffs. Or there would be people who say, gasoline prices have gone up, we need to do something. And really, there isn't very much you can do when gasoline prices go up, except one thing, which is getting rid of the uh, what's called boutique fuel environments, which is, uh, uh, boutique fuel requirements, which is the requirement that gasoline in different parts of the country has to have different amounts of chemicals and pollutants, uh, different combinations, chemical combinations. And if you reduce those requirements, then if there's a shortage in one state, such as Indiana, then you can bring in some from another state. Or if there's a shortage in uh, New York City, where there's very strict requirements, you could bring in some from Indiana. Uh, but of course, no one wanted to do that because it was anti-environmental. So these were some of the issues that we uh, focused on at the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, then when the Republicans, because I generally worked for the Republicans, I only worked for the Republicans, when they were out of power, then I would go and work in these think tanks and uh, write books and articles. Uh, my latest book is called Disinherited, How Washington is Betraying America's Young, about how government is biased against young people such as you and in favor of older people such as me. And I've also <laughs> written books on women in the economy. Uh, I wrote a book called Women's Figures. I called it Women's Figures, an illustrated guide to the economic progress of women in America because I thought maybe people uh, looking for uh, Playboy or uh, men's type magazines would click on Women's Figures and then my sales would shoot up. Well, 
It didn't quite work that way. They were too intelligent to buy my book for that reason. But it did get printed also in a second edition, so I guess it couldn't have gone uh, that badly. And I've written a book on overcoming barriers to entrepreneurship, about how to increase entrepreneurship in the economy. And I also have a family. Uh, I have six children. Uh, and uh, really, uh, the most important thing really in your life is uh, not what work uh, that you do, but uh, who you marry and whether you have a happy family life. That's actually much more important than all the books you write or the columns you write. I'm a columnist for MarketWatch.com. It's an online publication. I write a weekly column for them and a monthly column for tax notes, which is not available online, uh, about more detailed issues in taxation. Well, today Bob asked me to talk about economic growth. And in particular, <coughs> he asked me to talk about other conclusions in this book, the rise and fall of American uh, growth by Robert Gordon. Robert Gordon is a very well-known professor at uh, Northwestern University. And uh, what he showed was uh, in his book, he concluded uh, that we're not going to have as much growth in the future as we did in the past. So in the past, we went from, for example, uh, having an automobile uh, to, uh, having, uh, to having a great deal of economic growth because of changes in technology. We had many different kinds of technology, many improvements uh, such as electricity, uh, toilets, central heating, all different kinds of things. And no other 100-year period uh, has been, he says, uh, has been as productive uh, as what we had between 1870 and 1970. We had a lot more education. People went from practically no education at all. <laughs> People went from having no education at all to uh, having to routinely finishing high school and then going to college or having some college. Uh, and the work week declined very much for men. Instead of working practically seven days a week or six days a week, uh, they worked five days a week. And the amount of uh, the amount of hours men are working uh, is still declining. So Robert Gordon says, we're not going to see any of that anymore. And the question here is, uh, is that true? <coughs> is he right? Are there things we can do to improve economic growth to make sure that we go on growing at the same rate as we have already? Well, what he says is that new technology that we're going to be bringing online isn't, uh, won't increase our productivity as much as all uh, the new technology that came online between 1870 and 1970. He says that technology, rather than generating large increases in well-being, is only going to have a minor transformation. He was saying there was a big jump from the horse to the car, but now when you improve the car, it just has a better radio and perhaps better air conditioning, and perhaps it's a little bit quieter. It won't be as transformational. And uh, the lack of improvements in technology is one reason that our productivity is not going to be as high in the future. He says there are four drags on the economy that he calls headwinds, and those are going to be slowing the economy in the future. He says that the population is generally aging, uh, and uh, so young people are going to have to work harder to support older people. He says the quality of education is going down. People uh, are not getting as good education especially in public schools. And Russ talked a little bit about that before, about how schools <coughs> generally are insulated from competition. And that means when you are assigned to a bad school, it's harder to move to a good one. It's not like a smartphone where you can just buy a different one 
or trade up in case your phone isn't as good as you want it. And Robert Gordon says this is going to have very negative effects on what society can do in the future. Robert Gordon points to increasing inequality, which was the subject of a book by Thomas Piketty. He says increasing inequality is going to be slowing down uh, growth. Even though there is not that much evidence uh, for it, economists have come out on both sides of the issue. And if you look at some of the more unequal countries in the world, uh, such as the United States, they're very popular places to go, whereas some of the more equal ones, such as uh, Cuba or Haiti, for example, uh, have lower GDP, and you don't find people trying to migrate from high inequality places to low inequality places. Debt, Robert Gordon says, is also going to slow down the economy. And uh, it's like having a credit card with a large balance on it. And you always have to pay interest. So you can't buy the things that you want because you're always paying interest on uh, your old debt. And uh, I would say that debt. Uh, and education are possibly the most serious problems he has identified. But all these problems, I would think, <coughs> can potentially uh, be solved. And I'm going to talk a little a bit about that. I should say that Robert Gordon makes clear that what he's talking about is just about the United States and that there's great growth potential in some other countries. I think he's also talking about Western Europe. And uh, after I've just finished discussing Robert Gordon, I'm just going to move to uh, Israel. And uh, I expect uh, you to also join in the discussion and tell me how you think Israel can increase its economic growth. Well, what's interesting is that uh, economists don't, in fact, know very much about the future. Uh, they don't know so much about forecasting. They don't know what new technology is going to come along. Robert Gordon had an essay in 2003, which you can read online, called Exploding Productivity Growth, uh, where he said that productivity in the United States would grow by 2.5% to 3% over the next 25 years. So just even Robert Gordon in about that 10-year period, because his, book, his books and his papers were published around 2012. He changed his mind over that 10-year period. So even he was forecasting faster growth. And now he says uh, it's going to be slower. So economists, many of them are not modest, but uh, they really don't know what's going to happen in the future. Hardly anybody, for example, forecasts uh, Google uh, or the internet, or just even take it a few years back. If you look at economic forecasts right at the beginning of 2008, no one forecast that we were going to have this big recession. No one forecast that that was going to come along. So even when something is right under your nose, uh, you don't know that it's happening. Uh, another example is 1992, where there was about 3.4% GDP growth in the United States. And even during that year, uh, people didn't know that we had come out of the recession, that we, in fact, had come out of it uh, the year before in 1991. So we don't know, for example, whether Google's self-driving vehicle will work. We don't know if this is going to be something that people are going to take up in the future. You know, just as now, many people uh, in the United States, the rate of uh, young people take Uber or Zipcar instead of having their own car. They just, because uh, the price of car services, taxi services, has gone down so much. We don't know if maybe 10 years from now, driving a car like this will just be something that everybody does, or rather not driving it because it's self-driving, but just calling one of these vehicles on your smartphone and have it take you where you want to go, that really could be something that's transformational. It could be that uh, people own fewer cars, that we need fewer parking lots, because the car, after taking you, would then come and take somebody else. 
there are all kinds of things that we cannot even imagine. These are a few other things that perhaps we can imagine that might happen or they might not and they might increase productivity or again they might not. I mean there's drones instead of sending a letter and I know the mail is particularly bad in Israel but instead of sending a courier with your package instead of sending a courier you could just get a drone to take your package to for example Kikar Tzion right in the middle of Jerusalem <coughs> instead of relying on a courier because I know already that the mail is unreliable we don't know about new medicines whether it can change for example uh, genetic diseases such as uh, hemophilia where your blood doesn't clot or some other uh, diseases that are, um, th that are um, hereditary. People who I've, who I've spoken to about changing genes say that the biggest market is in fact for male baldness, that many people, is, that's something many people would want to fix. Uh, but we, that's very much cosmetic, but there are other important diseases uh, that could be solved new forms of food, there is a big push against uh, GMOs, which are uh, foods that have been slightly modified. But really this holds immense potential in terms, in terms of feeding the world's people, making crops that are drought resistant, making crops that don't get eaten by insects. Uh, we could be feeding billions more people, we could potentially eliminate hunger. Again, these are things uh, that we don't know. And I'm not even talking about artificial intelligence, robots that could eliminate jobs that are very onerous to do and that people don't want to do. So let's uh, uh, move, move on to Israel and let's talk a little bit about the Israeli economy. And if any of you uh, want to say anything, just be sure to raise your hand. Uh, Israel has a very dynamic high-tech sector, but part of the economy is slow growing. There's a lot of protectionist measures which impede the flow of goods into the country. In order to bring in a car, you have to pay a 100% tariff. If farmers produce too many crops, too many goods, they have to be destroyed. They can't always just go on the market prices have to be kept up at a certain level. Uh, so uh, there are many ways that the Israeli economy could be improved to have a higher GDP growth. There has been some privatization, but there are a lot, as you know, uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, GDP growth has been up and down. Uh, it's on a steady upward track. Right now, it's about 1%. I'm going to skip over these. There's more foreign direct investment, but uh, again, these things could be higher if there were not restrictions. Here's uh, deficit surplus as a percent of GDP. These figures are all online uh, if any of you want to look at them. Well, if we look at some of Robert Gordon's concerns and bring them back uh, to Israel, government spending is still very high in Israel, and there are ways potentially of cutting it back. If we look at his concern that uh, debt, government debt, is going to produce a drag on the economy, this is something that all of you perhaps uh, want to consider. 1960 when the government was more socialist, there was more government interference in the economy. Government spending was 29% of GNP. Uh, in 2014, it was 39%. Much of this, as in the United States, is transfer payments, payments to people who uh, cannot work or who are sick. In 1960, these were 5% of GNP. Now they've grown to 14% of GNP. Defense spending, funnily enough, has remained the same. Uh, it's still about 6% of GNP. Question over here. I seem to remember that uh, in 1973, government spending was almost 100% of GNP, and, government and military spending was 30%. 
So aren't those num aren't those years picked to illustrate the point? Uh, what I did was I picked a time about 50 years ago and now, but yes, I could have picked a different time. And uh, yes, yes, I could have picked, say, 1970s and then it would have gone down. There are always ups and downs. And your question just shows how economists can pick different kinds of data periods. So uh, undoubtedly it's improved since the 1970s. But uh, since uh, 1960, uh, it's got worse. So just for your information, here's the composition of Israeli government spending. Here's three different years, perhaps to answer your criticism, 1960, 1980, and 2014. So what we can see is that domestic consumption has grown. Uh, people are buying more. Uh, defense as a share of GDP has got slightly smaller than it was in 1980. Uh, general government investment is smaller than in 1960, but about the same as in 1980. Transfer and interest payments are larger than in 1960, but uh, smaller than in 1980. So. Uh, these are, uh, there have been changes, but there could still be uh, more improvements. You can see that with the transfer and interest payments taking up almost a third of government spending, there is potential to reform these programs because they don't add to GDP growth and it's possible to make them more efficient. We can see that since 1970, <coughs> economic freedom along an index has uh, increased, although it hasn't changed much over <coughs> since around uh, the beginning of the century, since about 2000. So there were big changes from around 1980 to 2000, and it's remained about the same. What's the benchmark for the economic freedom? What do you want to well, uh, well the, these, are, these are positive. It's positive that economic freedom has increased, and these are indices uh, that are produced by uh, the Fraser Economic Institute, and they have comparisons. And I can give you more of those data later. And what they do is compare different countries on a variety uh, of, uh, of measures. How can growth, if we are really interested in having growth rise, if we don't just want to take Robert Gordon's scenario, if we want to say, yes, productivity can rise and growth can rise, what are four ways of doing that? And I would say uh, there are many, many ways, but four that I have just picked out are tax reform, land use reform, immigration reform, and regulatory reform. Uh, these are ways that uh, Israel could perhaps increase its GDP growth. So if we look at taxes, uh, Israel is far better than the United States on its business tax rate. It has a corporate tax rate of 27% and a dividend tax rate of 25 to 32%. The United States, in contrast, has a corporate tax rate of about 35% on the federal level, then when you add state taxes, it's about 39% on average. So Israel is already doing far better than the United States. The average for the OECD is about 25%. So Israel's on the high side. And having lower corporate tax rates can potentially attract uh, more investment, or more importantly, stop investment from going abroad to lower tax areas. Uh, the top income tax rate, uh, the individual income tax rate is 48%. The United States has a slightly lower top rate. It works out to about 43%. It's written as 40%, but basically with different add-ons, it works out to about 43%. And why is the income tax rate important for economic growth? It's important because if the government takes 43% of each shekel that you earn, 
uh, you are less likely to want to earn that extra shekel than if they would take, say, 20% out of every shekel that you earn. So individual income tax rates being high has a big incentive, not just for people working, but also people making investments, uh, people making innovations. Why should they make investments? Why should they innovate? Why should they make new discoveries if the payoff is that the government takes almost half of each extra shekel uh, that they earn? In addition, Israel, uh, I, I have a question, question for Bob Boren. Um, what is the role of the income in Israel compared to the United States when the top rate kicks in? Uh, I don't have that information here, but I can look it up and let everyone know later. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, oh, plus there's the value added tax of 17%. And again, the value added tax means that you're going to want to buy less because it means everything is 17% more expensive. So if people buy less, then it means there's less of a market for people's goods. As Russ was talking about earlier, uh, people want to sell things, they invent things, they want to bring them to market. Once they do that, they want people to buy them. They want to get a return on them. And they're less likely to do that if they're more expensive. And this 17% tax takes away some of the buying power, so it means people buy less and it means that uh, investors and innovators have less of a return. We shouldn't forget the burden it takes to fill in taxes, and so I added that uh, tax reporting for businesses takes 235 hours. That's probably an underestimate. Uh, it, there's also a cost in actually doing the paperwork, filling in all the taxes, uh, in the United States today, it's tax filing day in many states, and for the federal government, uh, April 18th. So everyone's very much aware of all the time they've wasted getting together all their papers to actually fill in uh, their taxes. Here's another chart of the effective tax rates for small business in different countries. I'm not sure if you could read that, but it starts off with Japan, uh, and then the United States, then the OECD average, uh, then Israel, and then uh, Denmark. So Denmark has the highest tax rate for small businesses. This is the complete tax rate with about 65% tax. That's very typical for one of these socialist economies where they try and take lots of taxes and also provide people with more services. So I use Denmark as a representation. Uh, it's uh, for uh, the Scandinavian countries tend to be a very high up on the tax uh, area. So the, um, the dark red shaded area uh, is the value added tax. Uh, then there's the corporate tax and then uh, there's the dividend tax. So this is just an OECD comparison, which comes from the Taub Center. But there are more titles of taxes, right? Is it not like 100% of the taxes that they mm -hmm. uh, It's not 100% of all the taxes, but what the Taub Center tried to do was take some of the taxes that were in common in the different countries and make an index and do a comparison. I just picked out five. I picked out the lowest two, Japan and the USA. I picked out the o OECD average. I picked out Israel. All this and a more detailed chart is online at the Taub Center uh, in Hebrew, so all of you will have absolutely no trouble understanding it. And. Uh, the Taub Center also has a lot of very interesting data that you might want to look at. So here's the Israeli corporate tax rate with 35% declining to around 25% uh, uh, according to OECD uh, measures. But there's also room for further decline given that about half the countries are about lower than Israel. So in order to have more economic growth, lower taxes and cutting spending uh, is not just a project for one kind of tax, such as the corporate tax, 
but there's corporate tax reform, there's taxes on individuals, there's also, which we haven't discussed, the payroll tax, which is the tax that the government taxes employers and employees uh, to pay for pensions and social security. I'm not quite sure what it's called here, uh, but in, in, in the United States it's called social security. What is it called? Okay, yeah. Uh, and uh, value-added tax. So looking at these in all by trying to trim some of these taxes and at the same time trimming spending, uh, that can make economic growth higher. Uh, yes, question over here. There, there is a figure out, I don't know if it's, if it's any good, but that uh, if Israel wanted to be on average with OECD in the civilian government spending, it had to spend about another 150 billion shekels a year. Uh, like how, wh wh where should we cut the spending? If we're already spending very Six little. I mean, I mean, Israel spends 6.7% of its GDP for, for security reasons. Right, so, yeah. 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 So where, where, where do you think we should cut? Well, I think, I think this is probably, this is a very large subject and probably a subject for um, another discussion, but uh, one thing to do is uh, uh, welfare payments, also uh, retirement benefits. You find that as people live longer, the amount of pensions people are getting, if that is not reformed, grows every year. So that has to be adjusted. Uh, in the United States, for example, when Social Security was put in place in the 1930s, people received the benefits at 65, and the average life expectancy was 67. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who put in place Social Security, he never collected any of it because he died when he was uh, 63. Lyndon Baines Johnson, the president who put in place Medicare, he never received any Medicare because he died at 64. Now people are routinely living till they're 85, uh, 86, 87, 90. They're living about 25 years after these benefits are put in place, which is a wonderful thing. It's wonderful that people live longer. They can see their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, in some cases, they're great, great grandchildren. But the benefits have to be adjusted, either with higher contributions or gradually raising the retirement age. And I'm not saying it should be done for people who are right now receiving these benefits, but even starting it, making the change for people who are now in their 40s, for example, or now in their 50s, would have a dramatic effect on the amount of debt that Israel will incur in the future. There's also welfare benefits, paying people who are not working. There was someone from uh, Mark Perry's think tank, the American Enterprise Institute, called Robert Dore, and he was welfare commissioner of New York during the time of my, Mayor Michael Bloomberg. He managed, he managed to reduce the number of people on welfare by making sure that if they got money, they were either in a training program to work or they were in a job. If they didn't have a job, he placed them in a job. He got the caseload in New York City, the caseload is the number of people on welfare, from over one million to around 300,000. So he did manage to make that dramatic change. And it's very interesting that one of the things that the new mayor of New York has done, Mayor de Blasio, is roll back this work or training requirement with the result that people, number of people on welfare is going up and uh, the expenses for welfare are also going up. So these are other regulations that could be put in place to lower government spending. We find that entitlement programs, in other words, programs where people get money no matter what, that is the largest component of government spending uh, in the United States. And this is something that with some restructuring in the future uh, can be trimmed, because if we do nothing, it's just uh, going to get worse. 
So something else that it's important to think about is housing and land use reform. Uh, housing prices have risen tremendously. Israeli homes uh, have 1.1 room per person, some of the lowest in the OECD. Uh, and uh, much of the land <coughs> is owned by the government, so developers are not free to build when they see a demand. And one, this is important because, first of all, it is driving away some, some young people. You see people who go elsewhere just because it is so expensive to live in the desirable parts of Israel, where the jobs are and where the cafes are. Uh, so they decide they're going to leave and go to other countries. There's a, there's a statistic that more Israelis uh, left for the United States, young Israelis, than people immigrated into Israel. And it doesn't have to be that way. There can be land reforms that give private companies more options to develop the available land. Uh, there is, uh, I'm sure, good reasons that the Israeli government owns and manages all the land, but some of these regulations uh, could be rolled back. If the cost of housing were lower, then uh, young people would have uh, more access to have large families. They'd have more money to spend on other things. And it doesn't have to be that way. <coughs> Here's the amount of years it takes to build uh, a home in Israel. I didn't make this up. This came from the Bank of Israel. So if there's problems with these data, then uh, we can blame the Bank of Israel. So the total building time is about 13 years. It starts with a year to do a feasibility study uh, and plan. Then it takes about five years to get a district committee license. Another one and a half years for the plans. Half a year for the marketing. Three years for the permits. And two years for the building time. So it only takes two years to do the actual building. But for that, and I'm happy to give you copies of these slides if you're taking a photo of it. And it's also online at the Bank of Israel, but I'm happy to give you copies of these. You don't have to take a photo of it. Uh, but uh, this is something that's just not necessary. It doesn't, it's much greater than in other countries, the time and also the expense. And there are useful reforms that could be learned from elsewhere. Uh, so proposed reforms are decentralizing the control of land use regulation to increase competition between local governments. So if local governments had more control rather than the federal government, uh, then there might be more progress. I see I have a question down here. Is that right? Did you have a question? If you could tell me what your name is and ask. Yeah. So the advantage of the United, well, I mean, in the United States, you can build a house in about uh, six months or a year. Uh, but I mean, that's because the land is privately owned. So for example, you can, you can buy an empty plot of land and uh, right away start, you can have the plans approved relatively quickly and right then start building a house. So it's much easier when land is privately owned and we can actually see this with uh, oil exploration. We can see that the fracking in the oil exploration in the United States is concentrated in North Dakota and Texas, which is not federal land, which is private citizens allowing their land to be uh, used for oil exploration in return, of course, for payment from these oil companies. Where there's federal lands, you have to make an application uh, and then the government decides if it wants to grant it. So uh, it's the same with housing. Most, almost all housing in the United States is private. It's on private land. The government doesn't generally own the land. So you buy it from a private party. You employ a private contractor to set it up you get permits in different places, and the permits actually vary. I am in Maryland, which is just outside Washington, D.C. My, the person who did some work on our house and who builds houses said he doesn't do business in the District of Columbia in Washington, D.C., the capital, because he has to bribe too many people for the permits. But 
uh, when you have a system of competition between these state and local governments, then there are people who are willing to, who would choose, say, to live in Maryland or live in Virginia just to avoid the problems in D.C. And then you find that D.C. Uh, does manage to reform so that it catches up with the other jurisdictions. You find local competition. Where you have the federal government, as here, the government here owning all the land and deciding who gets what, and deciding, for example, that there are enough homes in Jerusalem so no more planning permission is going to be granted, uh, then you have a real problem because it's not the market that works. You can't assume, as we heard from Russ before, you can't assume there's going to be a house at a given price ready to buy the way you can assume that there's bread in the supermarket or shawarma in your favorite cafe because it's the government deciding are there enough houses or are there not. Uh, so a couple more suggestions. If limiting growth is necessary, price it, don't ban it. Uh, have a tax if you think there's an externality. And uh, ensure that the costs of regulation don't unduly burden small businesses. Uh, immigration reform. One thing Robert G Gordon was concerned about was technological innovation. And uh, we've seen in the United States that immigrants provide some of the best innovation, some of the best ideas. Uh, Google, uh, Yahoo, uh, they were started by foreigners who came in and with their education thought of an idea. In the United States, we have real problems with immigration and with visas. Even for people who are supposed to get visas, such as my Israeli daughter-in-law, who uh, has spent about the past couple of years trying to get uh, the requisite visa, a green card, uh, for the United States, which she is entitled to because she married an American citizen. It's even worse for people who want to come and start a business and innovate. The United States is losing many people to Canada because the process in Canada is much faster. You can get a green card, a residence permit in about a month, and that comes with a work permit for your spouse, whereas in the United States, uh, it can take years. There's an H-1B visa. There's a certain number of these allocated. It's about 85,000 every April. Uh, they are gone within about a week. And companies who want uh, high-tech visas for their workers uh, have to wait uh, another year. Uh, Israel also, I understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that there is potential for more immigration into Israel. Uh, foreign workers, I understand, are only allowed to work for a year and only in certain sectors of the economy. And uh, many businesses, again, are started by foreigners. So to have innovation, uh, we need to be open, uh, I think, to immigrants who want to come and start businesses. Now, this isn't saying that we have to have a welfare system that supports them and uh, gives them money while they are not working. This is not the same thing. We need to reform our welfare system uh, so that people who are, aren't, aren't working don't get benefits. But if someone from abroad wants to come and start a business, whether it's in Israel or the United States, we should be welcoming, welping, welcoming them with open arms because it creates jobs not just for them, uh, but for the native-born Americans and Israelis. It has very great spillover effects. So, yeah, I've said uh, encourage more immigration through more visas, uh, new businesses create more jobs, and immigrants disproportionately start, uh, start businesses. So, uh, economists know uh, many things, especially concerning the past, but people don't know and they find it very hard to forecast the future. I just made this this uh, slide, this is from an ad from T-Mobile. T-Mobile wants to give its customers free video streaming. Anyone would think this is a wonderful idea, but our government has, is saying to T-Mobile, no, you cannot give free video streaming. Uh, it means that they have unlimited video streaming uh, as part of their bundle of goods unlimited video streaming on their phones 
for their monthly fee. And for some reason, our government, through its what's called net neutrality rules, has decided that this is not a good idea and that this should be prohibited. So anyone would have, no one really would have forecast 20 years ago that you would be able to have uh, a little smartphone and that you could have unlimited video streaming on it, you could get movies. This wasn't really even thought of. So just in the same way as we have products today that we didn't think of 20 years ago, 20 years from now, we can be having products that we didn't think of today. But we need to put in place the right economic system that encourages these kinds of products and encourages immigration. And we need to work on these problem areas that Robert Gordon identified, uh, such as uh, demographics. Uh, if we have an aging population, we can do things to encourage immigration uh, that results in more younger families. We can do the things to stop the burden of the entitlements that basically result in younger people having to pay more to support older people. We can look at Chile, where they have a pension system that is privately funded and that isn't a drag on their economy. We have examples from around the world that we can use. And I don't accept that we have to say that productivity growth and economic growth is going to be lower in the future uh, than it is today. It doesn't have to be that way. We can make changes if we want. So with that, that's the end of my 45 minutes. And I'm very happy to take questions. We were talking about the housing crisis. Um, I don't know how much you know about that in Israel, but um, what would you suggest? Um, because you were saying about like regulation, et cetera. In a more practical way, what would you suggest to Israel to do about it? Well, I would suggest, first of all, that uh, the government release its hold on uh, some of the land. I understand that even if a developer wants to build houses on some of the land, uh, they are not able to do so. So, for example, you drive from the airport into Jerusalem and you see much empty, empty space. But apparently, if you wanted to build a house on some of that, uh, you couldn't. Even if you drive around the area of Beersheba and Omer, where there's lots and lots of empty spaces. And I asked my cousin down there, well, why doesn't someone build on this? He says it's not allowed. The government owns the land and it can't be built on. So I think that's the fundamental problem. Fundamental problem is the government owns the land. There's a very onerous permit system for allowing it to be developed. And uh, the, this also makes the whole process very expensive. Because if you're a developer and you have to spend years and years negotiating with the government, before you can actually develop a plan, uh, then uh, it, the whole process is much more expensive. So if it takes you, I mean, the, the, the building time is about 11 years. It takes 11 years until you reach the little yellow building time. So all that time the developer has to be paying and has to be negotiating. So that also adds to the prices. So, so basically what you're saying is that has almost nothing to do with, um, with low interest or money that is coming in from outside Israel, etc. Oh, yeah, that's right. No, 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 no. I think it purely, yes, uh, yeah. Because there are some claims in Israel that this is also a lot to do with. Well, I would say, no, I would say, uh, I, I would say most of it is the, is the availability. Because if it were more available, then more money would come in and there would be more people who would want to fund these projects if they didn't have to go through all the red tape. And uh, there are also people who want to come. I, I, uh, I understand that there are illegal Arab workers who charge less uh, for, for their services uh, for construction. They also want to be able to work. So there are also people who want to be able to work at lower wages building these houses, but they are not permitted to do so because they don't have the permit, and there are only a certain number of permits issued, and that permit is uh, that, that those permits, the number of those permits is, are, are limited. So this is, again, something that could be done to bring down the price of construction. Regarding to that, I also think that I mean, in Israel, um, we need about um, 140 average salaries, monthly salaries for, um, uh, for an average family in Israel. Um, in America, it's about 26 on average. Um, that's what I know. Sorry, so you need 140 what? Monthly salaries. salaries in order to pay, in order to buy an, an, an average, an average. Yeah. An, an average. See, yeah. So what would you think will be like the the the, the logical um, um I mean, around the 
100 or on 90 or on 26. How much? What number would you no think that is, 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 is? There isn't any reason with the right policies that Israel couldn't have the same amount as, um, as uh, the uh, United States, 26. 76. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, with the right policies in place, there is no reason it shouldn't go down to the American number. Yeah, I mean, all these, many of the high prices in Israel are purely artificial and are purely, a function, are purely because of government regulation. There's no reason, for example, that kosher cheese, a block of kosher cheese, should cost more uh, in Israel than in the United States. It doesn't make any sense, but that's the way it is. There are import controls, there are controls as to what people can produce. And there isn't any, these are for political reasons, and I understand that some of you study politics. These reasons are political rather than economic. There's people in your government putting in place these rules that make life more difficult for you. And it's up to you, and Mark Perry is going to show you how to, uh, how to change all this because he's going to say how to change the government and change the world one blog post at a time, but he's going to show you how to be an activist and how to try uh, to get these changes made. Because they're political, they're not economic. They don't have to be there. We're talking about a tax reform and some lower taxes, um, but I want, I want to assume that some of those taxes go somewhere. So if you uh, reduce the tax, wouldn't you have a um, trade-off in a way? So we have... Um, worse services in some ways, or indirect taxes that come instead? Uh, uh, well, f uh, I did say that, well, yes and no. So I did say that uh, this should also be accompanied by cuts in government spending, such as entitlement programs. There are some taxes that if you cut them, you find uh, reactions of people who work more or invest more. Uh, the famous example is capital gains taxes, taxes on capital gains. Uh, when you cut those taxes, you find that there are more capital gains and revenue actually rises. So there are what we call in economics dynamic effects, uh, where in some cases additional revenue uh, comes in. And if we look at the tax cuts put in place by George W. Bush between 2001 and 2003, the amount of revenue that was expected from those was underestimated. There was more revenue that came in because there was more economic activity. So yes, you do need to cut spending, uh, but you are also likely with tax reform to generate more economic activity, and that brings in additional tax revenue from your lower rates. Question over here. Um, in terms of uh, well-being, uh, don't you think people will prefer lower growth and better than work until the 80s and even higher because you need them to work more and you can pay them the yeah, do I think that people would prefer lower growth and that people would prefer to work less? Well, I think it's also a matter of directing your energies in a more productive investment. So here's an example. I was asked to estimate the amount of uh, jobs that regulation had reduced in the United States. We've had a lot of new regulations over the past eight years. And someone came to me and said, uh, Diana, I want, to s I want you to calculate how many jobs were eliminated because of the regulations, because then we want to repeal the regulations under a new potentially Republican administration. Uh, and then we want to justify this repeal by saying there are going to be more jobs. Well, it's a very, it's a, it's a nice question, but the answer isn't so simple. Because sometimes people, often people didn't just go from one job to no job at all, but they went from a job uh, that paid a lot to a job that paid less. So what you actually have to do is estimate it in terms of reduced gross domestic product. And so you find not just that people don't have a job or people working more. With these reforms, people can work the same amount but actually make more money because they can go into more productive enterprises. You also find that there are people who are not working who should be working. People who are just receiving money from the government uh, for not working at all. And the question is, is that right? And in uh, New York, Robert Daw said, no, that isn't right. And the number of people on welfare actually uh, did go down. 
Does that answer the question? Yeah, but I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about elderly people. Oh, elderly people. In their 80s. Or right, in their 80s. You, you, you yes, yes. well, that is why. You need yeah. to fire the Raise, yeah, right, the exactly. Uh, you need, yes, I was talking about raising the retirement age, and I was actually not talking about it for people who are in their 80s right now, or yeah. even for, for people who are in their 60s, but people who are in, uh, Certainly people who are in their 20s, people in their 30s, people in their 40s, and potentially people in their 50s. So that people can plan ahead and the retirement age gets raised gradually. What is it in Israel now? Is it 65? Right. So if it were raised gradually, say by three months every year, for example, uh, then, or one month every year, then people would be able to plan for it and they would know when they were 40 that their retirement age would be, say, 70 or 72. And I think the way to look at it is not in terms of the retirement age, but how many years are you going to be living off the government when you stop working? And that amount has been increasing. So it used to be two years, then it went to three years. Now in the United States, it's grown to about 12 or 15 years. There is a cost to this. The cost is, to all of you people, who are paying the taxes to support the old people. And it shouldn't be that way. We are imposing a tax on you, a tax on young people that's getting gradually larger and larger. And uh, there's a fairness aspect to it. I would say that it's not fair. And that people should be expected, that th that's why these programs should be reformed. And if you reform them gradually by saying, uh, on average, you're going to have, say, five years where the government's going to be supporting you, or uh, some other amount, uh, that's the proper way to look at it. But I'm not suggesting you change it to people who have made plans for the system and who are not retired. Yes, that's right. That would uh, be imposing an undue cost on them. Yes. Could you say uh, and the young people suffer twice? They pay more taxes today yeah. and they work more to, uh, tomorrow. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. I mean, we our right. generation, we, we will close the gap. <laughs> well, I think that, uh, I think these programs now, at least in the United States, are unsustainable. If you ask young people, are you going to get these Social Security benefits that the older people are getting, uh, they don't believe that they're going to re receive them. The benefits people are getting today uh, are not sustainable for people your age. There, there's going to be, these programs have to be brought into balance. The question is, are they going to be brought into balance suddenly or gradually? And I'm proposing uh, a gradual change. And, I'm, and I think also there have been other ideas, such as putting uh, a portion of government pension money into individually owned private accounts. This is also another, uh, this is uh, something that President George W. Bush proposed that he wasn't able to get through. But you find that the stock market grows faster than the government uh, government funds, so that actually increases the amount people have available for retirement. But the fees that the private uh, companies take, specifically in Israel, in the pension, are very high. Uh, in Israel today, they speak about opening a uh, family uh, government foundation pension to make uh, profit for the private people, because the com private companies take a lot of fees in the pension. So I think that uh, I, uh, I don't know anything about it, but I would suspect that entry into the pension business in Israel is very limited, because if it wasn't, then there would be some. Okay, so uh, Corinne says there's no competition. So in the United States, there's many, many companies that are allowed to uh, manage money. In fact, one of the regulations our government is just putting through now is reducing the number of companies that are allowed to provide these services, which will, of course, raise their price. When uh, there are popular uh, mutual funds that are index funds to the stock market that people can use at very, very low cost to save for retirement. They have tax-sheltered funds, and uh, they can be managed by a variety of uh, companies. There's a lot of competition. These companies publish what's called their expense ratio, which is the amount that they take out uh, of the, uh, of the um, uh, fund in order to manage it. There's a lot of competition. 
and there is uh, no problem uh, with that as long as you save the money. The problem isn't the company taking the money, the problem is can you use the discipline to set it aside and the government has certain incentives for that by allowing you to set aside uh, five or six thousand dollars a year uh, either tax-free or it grows tax-free until retirement. And I'm not sure if these are available here in Israel. They're called tax-free retirement accounts. No. No. So people can set aside, uh, and, and employers, people who are self-employed, can set aside up to $50,000 a year if they have that for retirement. Anyone can set aside five or $6,000 a year if they have that and put it into an account that then is saved for when they retire. Uh, and many people in the United States have that to supplement the government pension or their company pension. Uh, yes. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for giving us the lecture and the talk with us. Uh, oh, it's a you, great pleasure to be here. <laughs> for you, it's uh, 3 a.m., I think. Um, <laughs> No, so, no, 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 I try and think that it's 11.30, so <laughs> <laughs> you mustn't confuse me. Right. Um, I want to get back to the subject about the, the, the house uh, prices in Israel. Yeah. Um, one theory that you suggest is the, to get it more available for the people uh, that lands from the government will be more uh, free, that they will free it from, uh, from the government. Now, the problem is that the, the who managed that is the authority of the lands in Israel. This is a authority that, uh, it, with, with a lot of corruption. Um, the second theory is uh, that I heard about it, it's uh, to get more taxes about the housing. There are people in Israel that uh, take uh, houses uh, and this is their, their jobs. They take five, six uh, houses, and this is their jobs. And there is no tax, uh, tax about housing. Uh, there is only 10% of, of that. Um, and it, the 10% of that is just from who needs to declare. There are people that not, don't need to declare. Who needs to declare? There is just the people with uh, business for all the people that. There is no business, they don't need to declare. So people that own a lot of money can buy bus houses, and this is their job. Well, how it works? This and they don't thing. rent them out. What? They, they don't. They, they rent they don't. them out. This is and yeah. this is their yeah. job. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. it. Yeah. What's wrong so, with that? What's wrong with that? The, 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 what's wrong with that? that uh, I, I mean, don't we want people to buy houses and rent them out? Yeah. So people have rental. Accommodation. The, the problem is uh, young people like yeah. me, like everybody over here, uh, don't have any uh, money for that. They need to work uh, 130 uh, months for that. Yeah. Um, the pro another problem... Well, you see, uh, if I could just answer that comment. So what we need is we need more of these people to be building uh, accommodation and renting it out because then the price will fall. It's as though there was just one uh, bakery or one shawarma store in Jerusalem. Of course, the price would be very high. So we need more of these properties. And then people would be saying to you, well, why don't you come and uh, rent mine? It's at a lower price. And there would be sales, sale, low rent, one free month, etc. People would be competing to rent you property, accommodation, and then the price would fall. The problem is there isn't enough competition. That's why the price is so high. The problem isn't that people are buying these properties and renting them out. It's that not enough people are buying the properties and renting them out. We need more land, more properties, more building. If you look at Austin, Texas, it's one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. All you see on the skyline are cranes because they're doing so much building of apartments. So that's what we want. We want more people to do that. But anyway, I interrupted you. What's your second question? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Question over here. Right. It's about 1% in Israel right now, and in the United States, it's about 2%. Yeah. My question is, how is it possible to maintain these high rates of GDP growth? There isn't any natural, natural uh, sense of growth in the United States. 
saturation rate. So it's naturally impossible to do beyond this uh, high growth rate. Well, there have been, I mean, uh, there have been quarters, generally GDP is measured in quarters. There have been quarters that has been as high as, uh, uh, you know, 5 or 6 percent in the United States. Also in Israel, it goes up and down. China's growth rate is much higher. It's uh, now uh, 7 percent, but that's a decline from what it was, 10 percent, although the Chinese data don't really mean very much because the government invents the numbers. But it can be brought higher. There is no ideal GDP growth rate, but most people think in a developed economy here, it cannot be much over 4% on average, but it could be possibly brought from 2% to 4%. I think, uh, and with that, uh, there can be a lot more products generated and prices could be lower. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, uh, I want to ask about uh, land use regulation. Yeah. Uh, I agree that this is crazy, yeah. and, but my question is... And this is the Bank of Israel, so it must be right. No, no, I'm sure it's yeah. right. <laughs> I'm just saying it's crazy yeah. that this is the situation. No, I agree, yes. Um, but the question is, can you really have a housing market with no land use regulation? And here's why I think you can't. Because when you build a house uh, in a city, uh, like an apartment house, all the apartment house owners around it lose value. So they have an, in, an inherent uh, interest in creating land use regulation. That's the first reason. The second uh, reason is that when you build this house, you put more congestion on public uh, resources like roads, and everybody pays for it, so, so there's an externality. So for those two reasons, can you really have um, a, a, a housing market without land use regulation at all? It's uh, funny, I thought you were going to name a third one. Uh, I thought you were going to say, what if someone put up a really ugly building? <laughs> and, and that it looked bad, and so you have to have... Also a uh, right, exactly. So for example, there's an island off the coast of South Carolina called Hilton Head, and it has very stringent zoning requirements with the result that every house looks practically the same. You can't even paint your house. Uh-huh. Uh right. Yeah, yeah. All right, you can't even paint your house a different color because then, uh, uh, because people object. Well, I think the same could be said of any other businesses. What if you were to open up a bakery and produce a lower priced product? Isn't that going to affect the existing users? And I think you have to realize that uh, with competition, people do come and offer innovative products and they offer them at a lower price. And the same should be uh, true of housing. And that means existing owners have to compete. And if necessary, if people think that there is uh, a substantial loss, uh, then there could be some compensation. But in general, the way housing works in most countries is that people are not compensated if another property identical is built next door to them. Uh, in terms of congestion and use of, for example, electricity, sewer systems, cable, uh, uh, frequently the developers have to pay for that in terms of property taxes. There are property taxes le levied on apartments and on homes which pay for the costs of these services. And in fact, the more houses and more apartments are built, uh, given their economies of scale, it means that more and better services uh, can be provided. So I think these are very serious issues. I mean, it's a good question, but I think you cannot have a situation where an entrenched interest drives out other businesses and prevents people like you from having a lower price service. One area where this is coming into focus very much in the United States right now, and perhaps here also, is with the Uber taxi service. All of you are familiar with Uber, where you can call a ride on your smartphone. So in, the, in New York, taxi medallions, the right to be a taxi driver, people pay uh, over $100,000 for a license that enables them to drive a cab one of these caps. Higher. Russ is saying how much is it? It used to be over a million. Okay, it used to be over a million. It's a of exploiting people given that there's only a fixed number of caps. 
it's now about 500,000. Yes. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay, well, we're not going to talk about it now because it's going to be discussed tomorrow. But the point is that people were objecting to Uber coming in because all of a sudden the prices of these medallions went down from $1 million. You would pay this license a uh, million dollars and you'd be able to drive a cab or else companies would buy the medallions and then their drivers would be able to use them to drive cabs. So with Uber, anybody can get a car, a car and sign up with Uber and be a driver, which means, of course, that the cost has gone down uh, for people like us who want to uh, have rides places, who want to go places. Uh, and it means the medallion owners all of a sudden are disenfranchised. And Pardon? We have the same thing. Yeah. Right. <coughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway, the solution is not to stop innovation. The solution is, if we think there's a problem, to compensate or in some way compensate the losers, or to change the existing, uh, the existing um, regulations on taxis to make them lower cost, because it's very high cost in some ways. There are very high cost regulations on taxis uh, in New York. But uh, it's certainly not to stop technological progress. I mean, if we had said, for example, that we couldn't have plows, that people had to go on sowing fields by hand, because that's unfair to people who had the plows, uh, or we couldn't use uh, different kinds of computers, because that's unfair to people who used to type on typewriters. I mean, we would never make any progress at all. We need to make progress, and that means technology moves on. I'm not sure uh, you answered, maybe you answered some question, but I'm not sure it was mine. Um, well, why don't you repeat it and I'll do I, a better I, I'll job. Try I'll try to do a better job. Another way. Uh, the, fir the first is, uh, I didn't say that we should, uh, like, that it's okay that people will uh, try to prevent others from uh, building more, uh, more houses. We just said that they would. And that uh, in, a, in a democracy, they, they'll find a way to use government to do that, I think. That's funny, because we look on it as in democracy, we find a way to get round government. A and uh, that's why the technological sector in the United States has uh, been so rapidly growing, and, uh, well, the high-tech sector, because the regulators haven't caught up with it. Eventually, we find a way to get around the government. So I think that you should look on that as the purpose of democracy. The purpose of democracy is to get around the government. You, you, you need to fight these entrenched interests who say the purpose of democracy is to stop the innovation and to stop the buildings going up. The purpose of democracy is to go to your politicians and make the case that the housing price is too high and uh, that a situation like this needs to be fixed. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying, I don't think we can argue about the purpose of democracy because it's just a system. I don't think it has a purpose, but I, I know it can be used this way and yeah. if it can, it will. Right. Um, so we need to think of a different way of using it. Yeah, that's the point. Or somehow preventing other people from abusing it. You see, the entrenched, the entrenched interests, the people who have the existing apartments, the people who have existing businesses, are always going to try and keep out the new entrants. We see this in the United States with licensing being required to do all kinds of things that you don't need a license for, such as uh, being a hairdresser. Uh, braiding hair, even tree trimming. Seven states have laws saying you have to have a license to trim a tree, but you don't find that the trees in those seven states are better trimmed than the trees in the other 43 states. It's just a way of one group preventing another group from entering a market. And uh, there has to be uh, uh, a stand uh, taken against that because, in essence, there are more people who lose than who win from this regulation. And it's a matter of exerting political power, which is why, as I mentioned, it's so good that so many of you are studying politics because quite a lot of this comes down to uh, how you manipulate political power. Yes? Talk to people about this. And every single day, people come to visit Israel. The tourists come, come to us, or Israelis go abroad and come back. And the percentage of, it, of Israelis, the people who live here, who live in the United States, come back that in their suitcase have things that they bought in the United States and yeah. bring back here yes. because they're, they're cheap. Right. My, my, my sister just came to visit me, and she said, What do you need? So I said, you know, a, a stick of deodorant here, 
is about $5. In the United States, the same stick of dough you can buy for a dollar. So, so she, you know, she brought me a whole bunch of sticks of dough. We're all glad. Everybody here is happy. Externalities and energy. Well, one of the things, one of the things I'm frequently asked to bring is Ziploc bags. These little plastic bags with a zipper closure. And this time I came with me, believe it or not, with dog toys. Toys for dogs to play with. Apparently these are not available here. And uh, a dog owner, who uh, you might meet on Wednesday because she's going to come here to pick up her dog toys, uh, asked me to bring uh, dog toys. So I'm carrying a bag of dog toys. So, yeah. There was a question over here. You, yes. Uh, I read once in Africa about uh, an idea to improve uh, welfare, and the idea was to actually eliminate all uh, social security and all uh, money transfer for government to population, uh, but instead to give everyone, everyone um, a minimal or a minimal wage that can uh, sustain a minimal uh, lifestyle. Uh, and I wonder what you think about the idea. Uh, it is an interesting idea, and other people have proposed variations on the, these. Uh, some have proposed a certain amount that someone would get every month, no matter what their income is. Charles Murray has proposed that people who are born get a certain amount of money, uh, and this would last them for their transfer payments throughout their life. Uh, the problem is that, well, there are two problems. First of all, some people might not n need it. And so what you're doing is you are giving funds to people who might not need them. People might not need them early, might need them early on, but not later. So why should you be giving it to them later uh, when they need it early on? Uh, second, some people might need more. Say you have someone who's disabled, who's in a car accident, who can't work, so then that sum might not be enough to tide them over. So you would have to think, how am I going to reallocate and give them more money in the future? So I think you are going to have to go through some process of reallocating anyway. So why not just do it based on conditions and income? And the advantage of having it linked to income is it becomes a social safety net. And maybe you want to argue about how much people should get. Or with unemployment benefits, should they get them six months or three months? Or with uh, medical services, should they get them if they're at this income group or that? But I think we do need some kind of social safety net in place that's income based. There are major majority of Israelis are uh, household are own their house they live in, like seventy percent. Yeah. So you can if you have like a, a lobby of dairy farmers, yeah. you can have the majority of people take a stand that you shouldn't have protectionist policies. Yeah. But you can't in a democracy win when you have seventy percent majority against you with an invested interest. Mm -hmm. it's, that's that's my question. Mm -hmm. If this is the situation, yeah. how can you possibly win against this? Right. They benefit. I think that if you were to ask, I think if you were to ask the majority of Israelis if there is a problem in the housing market, I think many of them would say yes, and there need to be changes. Plus, uh, in addition, uh, it's not just they have children, but. Uh, in addition, some of them might like the capability of buying additional houses and renting them out. Because if the housing market were opened up, there would be a variety of other businesses. If there are more houses, there's also more jobs for people who sell furniture, who put in plumbing, who put in electricity. I mean, building houses has vast other effects. So I think that even though the majority of people do own houses, also some of them might like to move up to bigger houses. Some of them might not be happy with their 1.1 room per person. Maybe they want two rooms per person. Uh, so they might want to move to bigger houses. Somewhere else. They might want the houses built somewhere else. Well, some people might want to develop other homes within their neighborhood, for example. Or if there was some kind of uh, empty plot of land, it could be used for something better or some uh, shopping center, for example, uh, that, uh, or some project, some large car park or warehouse that could be torn down and have an apartment block that would be more attractive on it. I'm sure all of you can think about potential warehouses that could be moved out, for example, to the Beersheba area, 
uh, to leave room for more development in Jerusalem, more housing development. Yes. Um, it's a bit uh, off topic. Oh, no problem at all. <laughs> Uh, what, what do you think about the gas uh, monopoly here in Israel? Yeah, uh, the um, gas monopoly. Well, things such as gas, uh, some of these large enterprises, uh, it's harder to have competition. And it's not really my subject. I don't know uh, very much about it. But the problem is that the government, I think, exerts much too much control over the company. It's not just that the company, Nobel, has a monopoly. It's that the government is, has intrusive regulations over what that company can do. So I think that there's a problem there that it wants to develop the gas and that it isn't being able to develop the gas. But I know that this is a very controversial area and we should certainly talk about it sometime in the next couple of days. In fact, when I was at the last seminar, we had the head of Noble Gas come and give a dinner lecture uh, where he was explaining the problem. And that, I'm not sure if we have a recording of that, Bob, if that's been recorded or not, but that might be available online. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, this is a, certainly a very important subject and we should discuss it more over the next couple of days. Yes? Uh, I would like to ask about the uh, house prices. Uh, well, there is a uh, Opinion, general opinion concerned that uh, if the house prices will uh, decrease, um, the, there is a, there will be a problem just like in the U.S. in uh, 2009 of the of uh, the people who, who won't have a, a, who don't will not uh, want to pay um, the debt to the to the banks and the, uh, there will be a, a problem in our bank system. So, um, yeah. what do you think about that? Well, I, I, I think first of all that uh, any decline is probably going to be gradual. Second, the problem in the United States in 2009 was that people uh, had uh, only owned about 5% of their house and the mortgage was about 95%. And from what I understand here, that's not possible. Uh, the amount of mortgage is much smaller, people own uh, a much larger share. So the crisis that happened then, uh, I don't think could happen here. In addition, there were rules on the banks in the United States that most people don't talk about as a cause of the financial crisis. There was a law called the Community Reinvestment Act. The Community Reinvestment Act required banks to lend a certain, make a certain proportion of their loans to low-income individuals with poor credit ratings. So they did this because they had to follow the law. Then, uh, when the value of the home went down and the interest rates went up, these individuals could not pay back the mortgage. Then the banks were blamed. But it wasn't the bank's fault because they were required to lend money to these individuals. So even now, after the financial crisis, the government is going back to these banks and saying you have to lend a certain amount to minorities uh, in order to reduce inequality. They look at who the banks are lending to by race. They say you're not lending to enough African Americans, you should lend more. But yet the banks have these credit standards. The banks are told to uh, bypass the credit standards in favor of lending to low-income individuals in order to fulfill the law. So this isn't a problem that you have in Israel, uh, thank goodness. And this is something perhaps Pedro could talk about more when he talks about it because he is an expert on um, banking and monetary policy. Um, how do you suggest to, uh, well, you talked about decentralized uh, um, use of ground uh, in, in Israel. Uh, it's uh, it's a, it's a um, government monopoly. So how do you practically suggest you to do that? Because um, I can only imagine that um, you'd have to fight buyers, buyers for the ground, and it would probably be people with money, who would only create more monopoly of the ground. So one thing that could be done is moving it from, uh, I, I, uh, I'm not familiar enough with the situation, but I don't know if there's any city jurisdictions. I don't know if it could be done by moving from the federal government to the city jurisdictions, moving it more into uh, local control, or some of these parcels of land 
could just be auctioned off to the private sector. So those are two possible ways of doing it. And someone would not pay the price for it if they weren't going to develop it. <coughs> so that would give revenue to the government, and some of this revenue could be used for other purposes, such as defense or education or environmental improvement. But having the government just sit on the land isn't bringing in any income for it either, and it's not achieving its maximum use. Uh, I would suggest giving it away just results in windfalls for politically connected individuals. If it were given away, then it would be the friends of, of uh, Mr. Netanyahu who would be given the land. Yeah. No, I'm saying give it away. Everybody would get a share, like basically a national lottery about every Israeli living today would be getting a share yeah. of land and that the market will uh, basically right. sort it out, like I would yeah. sell to. Well, something that was done in uh, England when selling off some of these large uh, natural monopolies or so-called monopolies such as the gas and the electricity uh, was to allow individuals to buy shares in a trust. So it could be something like a real, real estate investment trust and people could buy shares or be given, in it, uh, be given shares. And I remember my grandmother telling me, uh, Diana, uh, I bought shares in it. Diana, I buy the shares because they go up. So she knew she would go in the lottery, she would get the shares of the electricity company, and she would be expecting them to go up. That was something that Margaret Thatcher did. Margaret Thatcher also sold the government-owned what was called council houses, the affordable housing, to the tenants at relatively low uh, amounts. Well, they weren't so low amounts, it was uh, it seemed a reasonable amount at the time, but anyway, she sold them, uh, then all of a sudden creating a class of uh, property owners of people who had never owned uh, their apartments in their lives. Uh, plus, these individuals then took much better care of the apartment. Uh, they improved them. Uh, they then sold it to other people. So all these things can be done with the price system uh, if the government gets out of the way. Well, thank you very much for listening. We